the FCC revoked a $900 million subsidy, I guess, program from Starlink. And you felt it was because why? Yeah, this is a pretty puzzling decision to me that really can't be explained on the law or the the facts or really policy. I think it can only be explained when you step back and look at what, you know, frankly, it wasn't my term, but the Wall Street Journal uh, called regulatory harassment of Elon Musk. And it cuts across uh, a wide range of administrative agencies. With the FCC in particular, you know, we issued this award uh, to Starlink back in 2020, uh, almost a billion dollars to, to your point, to subsidize, to ensure that 640,000 rural homes and businesses would get covered with high-speed internet, 100 over 20. Uh, and what the FCC did last week was in a, a three to two decision. So there's five commissioners. I'm the senior Republican. Uh, there's three Democrats. It was a party line vote. They decided to revoke that award of one, nearly $1 billion. And the reason they said was because we don't think it's uh, reasonable or that Starlink is reasonably likely to be able to deliver 120 internet service to those 640,000 locations. And there's a lot of problems with that decision if you look at it you know individually but i think the, the the strongest most compelling point is that the federal government itself is relying on starlink for very mission critical operations and connectivity the military is entering into multi million dollar deals with starlink you know as we speak and so plainly i think the technology in the federal government's view is reliable so what's going on here and my theory of the case is that it goes back to last year when president biden uh, was in the White House and stood behind the, the podium with the official seal of the president of the United States and said that Elon Musk is worth being looked into. And a reporter followed up and said, how? And President Biden said, there's a lot of ways. Uh, and it's true. There are a lot of ways. And since then, this pace and cadence of, again, regulatory harassment or inquiries looking into Elon Musk have been rather unprecedented. You've got the FAA, the NLRB, the DOJ, the Federal Trade Commission, the Southern District of New York, the FAA. And now the FCC joins in the mix. And so, again, I think any of these individual decisions don't make a lot of sense other than tying it back to what President Biden said at the podium. Because, look, administrative agencies, um, you know, they understand the cues that are being sent from upon high. And I think that they read that that statement from President Biden as a green light. Now, look, there's another way of looking at it, which is to say Elon Musk has a lot of business operations. So, of course, he's going to run in with the government a lot of businesses that are on sort of the the leading edge of a lot of these industries, and therefore maybe you're going to get extra scrutiny. And I, and I get that. But again, if you look individually, like the NLRB basically went after them because they insisted on having black t-shirts at Tesla, as opposed to allowing people to wear uh, t-shirts that would promote unionization. Or you look at um, the Federal Trade Commission, and they were asking to get information about reporters that were getting access to information as part of the, the Twitter files reveal. Or the Fish and Wildlife Service, which went after them because there was a uh, a handful of bobwhite quail eggs and some blue land crabs that got charred uh, after a SpaceX launch. And so when you look at these individually, again, they don't mm. seem to hold up other than when you tie it back to that broader position of the president. So let's just get to ground truth here. Uh, because politics has been inserted, I want to get to ground truth. As you've said, the government is buying Starlink. It is mission critical. I have Starlink at both of my homes. Here, as you can see, I'm at my ski house and then at my other house. It frequently performs at the level of my broadband connectivity. In other words, I'm able to tape This Week in Startups and the All In Podcast over Starlink. And in fact, I have Starlink because I need a backup. I'm a professional podcaster. The $1,200 I spend each year on Starlink at two different homes, which is $2,400. If I were to miss one episode of a podcast, you know, it's thousands of dollars in ads. It easily justifies me having them as just as backups. But when I use them, a commissioner, respectfully, they hit 100 slash 20. And people who are on boats, who are in remote areas, are buying these because it is the, hands down, best solution for a rural or a non-landline connection. So what am I missing as a consumer, a dedicated consumer of Starlink, and all the people who are in rural areas, what are they missing and the people on boats and planes? And the government, what are we all missing about 100 slash 20, which we get from Starlink and we're over the moon about and people are raving, raving on social media when they get on a plane with Starlink. I believe there are a couple of airlines that have it now that they cannot believe that the broadband, wireless broadband is as good. What, what are we all missing from our first person realities? 
Yeah, look, again, we didn't have any milestone or deadline for Starlink to kick in until 2025. That's when they were supposed to provide service to at least 40% of that 640,000 location. And yet the FCC's decision said, we don't think it's likely that they're going to get there uh, by 2025, which again, doesn't make sense when you look at people's individual experiences. What they pointed to specifically was there was some UCLA nationwide speed test average data that was showing speeds below 120. But again, Starlink didn't need to hit 120 until 2025. And moreover, the UCLA data was, you know, averaged nationwide. It wasn't about, you know, how are they directing beams to these particular communities? And the other thing to think about is, you know, competitively as well. So we ran this, what we call it a reverse auction, which means in, in 2020, we said, we're setting aside $9 billion and we're going to try to connect something like 8 million uh, homes and businesses that were on the wrong side that just provide to high-speed connectivity for the first time. And we let a range of different technologies compete. And it was controversial at the time that we even let Starlink, and there's other low-Earth orbit uh, satellite systems that are going up right now. Amazon's Kuiper is one that's getting up and off the ground now as well. And so we bid it out, and Starlink won in these areas, but other providers won in other areas. There was something like 180 different winners, uh, some fiber, some fixed wireless. So there's a lot of different technologies that won. But again, you know, we really sort of created an entirely new standard and applied it only to one of those 180 winners, which was Starlink, and said, look, since you're not doing 120 today, uh, we're not you know, reasonably confident that you're going to do it in the future. And again, it was a backwards decision, too, because they looked at the, the, Starship, um, the Starship launches and they said, well, those have been failures. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, we made fun of trade press that thought that those were failures. We don't understand how technology works. So again, to say, we're looking at these two data points, these two Euclid speed test data points, and we're going to somehow draw a straight line between them and say, look, you know, we don't think you're going to get to 120. That's not how technology develops. It's a hockey curve that sawtooths along the way. And so I think it was a really sort of backwards looking decision from the FCC from, a, from just an understanding of technology perspective, too. Listen, selling software is hard enough right now, man. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat out there in B2B land. The last thing you need to do is slow your sales team down because you don't have your SOC 2 dialed in. So if you're SaaS or a services company and you store consumer data in the cloud, you know what you need to do? You need to check out Vanta. They're going to get your SOC 2 compliant easier and faster. And Vanta makes it so easy to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. They're going to save you hundreds of hours of work and up to 85% on compliance costs. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on those major customers, the lighthouse customers, the big fish, the whales, because of silly stuff like lacking compliance. Just work with Vanta. I'm an investor in the company. It's a great company. Get your compliance automated. Get it tight. Tight is right. And close those big deals. Here's the best part. Vanta's going to give you a thousand off because they love this week in startups. They love startups. Vanta.com slash twist that's v-a-n-t-a dot com slash twist to get a thousand dollars off your sock too